for years and years, I worked in the private sector building companies. My background is in engineering, but I didn't like engineering, so I quit and I went into business. After 27 years of working in business and building companies, working with, with people, um, it felt like a big social club that took me all over the country. Uh, I, I retired. I retired in 2009, and I devoted my time to working for the sake of Allah Azzawajal, working, meeting with people like yourselves. And I've been here several times before. How many of you have been to my workshops before? Raise your hand if you have. There's about 10 of you. Jazakum Allah khair. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, um, then one day I realized that uh, our community, once I got into a leadership position at the national level, I realized that our community uh, needs a specialized knowledge in an area that we're not good at. Let me give you uh, an idea of what I'm talking about. You see, for an organization to succeed, there is a two by two. There's two things that have to, that play out. One is leadership, everything about leadership, charisma and ability and technical knowledge and, and uh, the ability to mobilize and influence people. And there is structure. The most successful organizations, well, let me tell you about organizations that, that don't do well at all. They're the ones that have neither. Usually they don't survive. They don't have good leadership, they don't have good structure, they don't survive. There are organizations, that, uh, mostly social organizations, social movements, activists, students, people with issues, liberation movements. A lot of these organizations are started by well-intentioned people like many of our, ourselves and our children. I mean, I started parking cars in the masjid 40 years ago so that others can enjoy their Eid. And then by the time I got home, Eid was over. And my wife would get mad at me, and, and, and I would tell her, you know what, inshallah, this is for the sake of Allah. Azzawajal. So many of us probably started that way, uh, working as activists. Those types of organizations, at some point, when they succeed, their success starts causing their failure. What that means is they find themselves big, and they have followers, but they don't have structure to go along with that. Meaning they don't have policy, they don't have guidelines, they don't have, they, they don't have the ability. Uh, let's take just one example, media for instance. How do, how do you deal with the media? You have to frame your, your, your case in such a way that the media cannot mess around with it. If you don't have proper structure and you don't have a budget and you don't have experts in that area, the media will make up your story for you. Isn't that what Fox News is doing to us? Isn't this what the U.S. media in general and the, and, and the Western media is doing to us? Every time we, we come up with an issue, the, the, framing, the framing means how they project, how they portray the story. Their framing is a lot better than ours, and we don't know why. It's because we don't have proper structure. So an organization that, that, that starts with activists cannot stay that way. At some point, it has to grow and become a, and, and have, it has to have structure so that it can survive. So here's the deal. There are organizations that start, that are started by activists and remain that way, and they reach a certain plat plateau, and they stay there for years and years and years, and they start scratching their head and saying, how come nobody's listening to us? How come we're losing members? How come we're shrinking after we were growing? all these problems. Then there's the other organizations like the Heritage Foundation that are started, also nonprofit, that are, by the way, there's 1.7 million charitable nonprofits in America, 2.7 million that are not charitable, that are the total. But 1.7 are charitable, and very few of them are similar to our organizations. The majority of them are started with big money, big budgets, and with founders who know what they want, and they go after it. So they start with structure. They start with professionals who know what they're doing, they have policy, they have everything, and what they lack is activists, well-intentioned activists who are willing to sacrifice time and effort. So they, their success is also limited. The most successful organizations are the ones that have both, that have activists that are committed to the cause, and at the same time, they have good structure to go along with that. So this is kind of like the result of it's just a brief description of what I'm about to go to. And, and Brother Sahib, Jazallah Khair, Sheikh Sahib, uh, touched on it a little bit in the last few statements that he made. He said, we need to build our institutions. 
And that's what my presentation is all about. For us as a community to succeed, by the way, there's a handout that has all this information in it. It'll be given to you later on, inshallah, in the afternoon session. And also there is a, a Jum'ah khutbah, a half hour khutbah on YouTube that covers this subject. And in brief, I'll just tell you the, 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 the highlights of the presentation. Basically, for us to succeed as communities, we need to have goals in four strategic areas. And this is based on a theory in sociology called the public value framework. It's a complicated name for something simple. It basically says you got to build your organ start with your organization and build it from the inside out. You got to start with the organization. Whichever organization it is, whether it's mass, care, whatever, you have to start with the organization. And there are four different areas you have to look at. I'll go it into it in detail in a moment. The second area you need to look at is your membership. Let's define membership. Membership are the people that are connected with you. You know the series Unmasked? We're talking about the people who are masked, not the unmasked ones. In other words, the ones that show up at the masjid. And we're not going to get too technical and start defining how often and whether they pray Fajr and Isha or not. We're just talking about people who identify with us, who consider themselves Muslims, and who show up at the masjid, they show up at our conventions and, and conferences, and, and they identify with us without any judgment, just, just by them showing up. Then there is another area, a group of goals that we need to have with regards to those other 90% of our community that we hardly see, that carry names like Muhammad and Abdullah and Mahmoud, and yet you rarely see them. You may see them on Eid, you may not. There are, we have to have goals related to those people, and then there's the, there is the society at large that we live in, that we belong to. We have to have goals as far as that's concerned, and that's, of course, the work of care and people like that. That's part of their work. So these are the four major areas. Number one, does anybody remember what it was? Goals re regarding what? Our organization. So somebody was paying attention. Thank you. Um, I have a gift for you after the class, inshallah. Uh, I usually carry books with me. I couldn't bring stuff with me from New Jersey to California. People thought I was nuts because I'm carrying a coat. So I came out of the plane and I'm the only one who has a, a coat on his hand. A really nice, big, thick coat. They don't know that I'm going to Chicago tomorrow morning. That's supposed to be a joke. Anyway, it's too early in the morning. So the first one was the organization. Let's talk about the organization. Um, Somebody did uh, a lot of research about public organizations and nonprofit organizations and published a book uh, that is, uh, the, the authors are two people, Borman and Deal, if anybody wants to research it further. And they say that if you really, really want to build, uh, study an organization, you've got to look at it from four different areas, at least, four different areas. The first one has to do with its structure. When we talk about structure, we're talking about what I was talking about earlier, which is how is this organization put together? Is there an organization that has uh, central leadership, that has hierarchy of leadership? Or is it an organization that values the democratic process and the, flat, the flatness of an organization? Here's the problem. The organizations that are considered structureless, an example of that would be the women's liberation movement of the younger generation. The women's liberation movement went through transition. There is the older members of the, 60, the, the 50s actually and the 60s, and 70s, and then there is the younger ones. The older ones didn't mind the hierarchy, didn't mind to have leadership structure and people reporting to people and policies and so on. The younger ones, the hippie generation, no judgment here, I'm just naming them for what they were. That young generation valued their freedom and they didn't like structure, they didn't like to have a boss, they didn't like to report to anybody, so they wound up with structureless organizations. Many of our Islamic organizations operate that way. We come from countries that are dictatorial in, in, in some ways, and where if you, if nobody wants to hear what you have to say, and if you said anything, you'll go to jail or you'll get killed. So as soon as they land here in the US or in Europe or whatever, there's a little bit of freedom, we can't wait to open up our mouths and start expressing ourselves. And then you want somebody to come to me the day I joined an organization and tell me that I have to raise my hand and wait my turn and that there is somebody in charge and that there's parliamentary rules and there's all these things. Are you kidding? I ran away from that. I want to be free. So many of us resent 
the whole process of structure, and they would rather be loosey-goosey, structureless. Actually, one of our brothers in, that, in one of the highest leadership positions in our organization one time sent me a book called The Starfish and the Spider. And when I started reading it, I couldn't believe my eyes. This brother is giving me a book about structureless organizations. And I'm like, but didn't Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, Didn't he say, if you are two or three, pick an Amir? How does that, how does that jive with structureless organization? Our deen is about structure. Our deen is about, is about putting somebody in charge. In salah, in jama'ah, and every time there's a jama'ah, there has to be somebody in leadership. And yet, because we hate dictatorial systems so much, and, 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 and we are giving an opportunity to breathe, all of a sudden, we throw the baby with the bathwater. All of a sudden, we don't want democracy. We, we don't want uh, leadership. We don't want structure. We want democracy. Democracy means I can talk whenever I want. I can do whatever I want. Leave me alone. That kind of structure in, in some of our organizations is holding us back. It's holding us back quite a bit because without proper structure, there cannot, we cannot frame our argument correctly. We cannot give our leaders the proper place they need in front of the media, the proper credibility in front of the State Department, in front of American public officials. Other organizations that, that edify its leaders, their leaders are better listened to than our leaders who are usually uh, uh, homegrown. I mean, they are from the rank and file and they come through the election process. Usually they're activists. And many times they don't even know the most basic rules of leadership. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. Uh, they are actually more honorable than some of these high paid officials in some of the other organizations. They, they grew in the organization. They, they started. These are grassroots organizations. But that is one of the areas we need to look at. And I'm raising more questions than answers. I'm not giving you answers. I'm just telling you how complex this issue is and how we need to take a strong look at our organizations from the inside to see what we can do to make them work better in the environment that we live in here in the United States. We are not living in Amman or in Dubai or in, in Egypt. We are living in America. We need to deal with the American context and have our organizations adapt to this context so that we can become effective and influential. So the structure is an important area, but we have to look at the organization from three other areas that are equally important. Structure is only one of them. The second one is resources, human resources and financial resources. Human resources, many of the people that are running our organizations are not trained. Many times it's the first available person uh, th that we can find. It's, it's cousin Abdullah who just lost his job. Let's hire him as a masjid official. And, and then all of a sudden he's got a job. And then you try to find out if this brother knows anything about management or leadership or administrative duties or anything, nothing. So we don't have proper standards for whom do we hire to run these organizations. But that's just one small area. What about financials? Because that's related to financials usually. It's because we are broke. So we hire the cheapest person who will take the job. And if two people, if one of them is highly credible, but he, he or she costs $50,000 a year, somebody shows up and says, I'll do it for 25, we'll take the 25, even if the, the one for 25 cannot do the job. And it goes back to money. So why is it that we have problems with money? Here's the reason. I'll give it to you in a nutshell. More than 50%, <clears throat> may I have some water, please? More than 50% more than of the nonprofit, the charitable nonprofits in this country, which count, listen to me, don't worry about the water, I'll, I'll choke, just leave me alone. Uh, <laughs> here's the deal. There is one and a half or 1.7 million nonprofits, charitable nonprofits in this country. Mashi? 1.7 million. Of those 1.7 million, more than half of them, listen to this, get more than half of their funding from the U.S. government through initiatives like the faith-based uh, faith initiative. We don't know anything about that. I am taking a course with a professor who has been doing uh, grant writing for 31 years. In the 31 years, he wrote more than 500 grant requests. 220 of them were approved to the tune of $120 million, a single person. And he belongs to a certain ethnic background, so most of the money went to his people. I don't need to say more. All right? As I'm paying attention to this guy, I'm saying to myself, how come we don't have people like that in our community? 
All it takes is a three credit course, six, six credits, one, one course in fund development, which, which, is, which is different than, listen to this, listen to this. Here's what we're going to do, probably to here or Chicago tomorrow. Uh, 5,000, 5,000, 5,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000. Same fundraising method that we've used for 40 years has not evolved one bit. We keep robbing our community of its last nickel. With, and and there's, a treasure, there's a treasure of billions of dollars. There is $500 billion sitting in bank accounts ready to be given away. $500 billion already given away, ready to be, to, 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 to be requested. If only we knew how to fill out a grant request the proper way. If you look at the instructions for how to fill out or ask for a grant, uh, for a grant the instructions on how to fill out the application is a book. And to take it, you probably need 15 weeks of instructions in front of somebody who's been doing it for 31 weeks, as I have, and at best, you will be mediocre. This person's approval is 40%. The national ratio is 5%. That's how good he is. We need to find people like that. We need to train some of our youngsters on how to write a grant request. All you need is good English and good structure and to, be, to know how to follow instructions. So, so, so this is the second thing, the human resources and the financial resources. We're not good at that. We need to have some good, strong strategic uh, planning in that area. Third, we need to look at our organizations as far as politics is concerned. The word politics, I don't have time to explain it, but in brief, when somebody is being political, it means he's using power to manipulate the situation, okay? It's not a siyasa sharia that Ibn Taymiyyah spoke about and, and the scholars spoke, al and others spoke about it, which is idarat masalih al-ibad bi muqtada al-shari'a to manage the affairs of people according to sharia. This is not what the Western concept of politics is. The political framework simply means how many of the people in the organization, instead of using deliberations, an honorable way of get, uh, making decisions, how many of them do you use, use arms twisting and their, their personal power or their social power, or whatever power they have, to get people to go along instead of doing it the right way? And I don't want to use the word democratic because even the democratic process could be skewed and used improperly. You know, and I'll cover that in the afternoon, inshallah. So, so the political frame, we need to look at the organization and say, how political are they? A certain amount of politics is manageable. Sayyidina Amr ibn al-As was known. Amr ibn Khattab used to look at Amr ibn al-As and he used to look at somebody who's like maybe uh, an idiot savant, is that the word they use? Somebody who's not smart. And he would say, Subhanallah, khalaqaka wa khalaqa Amr ibn al-As. Praise be to Allah who created you and created Amr ibn al-As. Because Amr ibn al-As was such a genius. He was, he was so, so smart, so political. In, in other words, he, he managed to convince people of his position so easily. And there were, they were dumb people walking around. So Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab would say, wow, what a disparity between this and this. In other words, the whole issue of the political approach is not in and of itself haram or wrong. It's the abuse of it that is not allowed. Now, if you and another person and another person, you are all political and you are equals, fine. Bukhari kasirbado. Smash your heads against each other and let's see, may the strongest one win. But if we have, you know, 10, 15 people who are new junior board members and there's a couple of people on the board who have been around, Mukhadramin, they've been around like for five, six years and they start drawing circles around the other ones. This is nonsense. We need to look at that and see how much of that is going on in our organizations because that can pull the organization down and cause people to lose trust in the organization. And the fourth is culture. How much? I'm almost done. Subhanallah. No, no, I'm almost done. Khair, <laughs> inshallah. Khair, inshallah. Um, the, the fourth, the fourth uh, uh, area that we need to look at is culture. Culture, there, there are books written on the subject of organizational culture. The first one to write on the subject of, uh, in, 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 in a serious manner was Edgar Schein from MIT back in the 60s. You can look him up as C-H-E-I-N. And then there is Anne Kademian recently wrote a very, very good book where she summarized all the theories. In brief, here's what, how it goes. Like the Quran says, هذا, هذا The Quran, uh, uh, taunts the mushrikeen for when they heard the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa one of the reasons why they objected to the message 
is that they, they, there was this cultural, one of, one of the French scholars, uh, philosophers call, calls it habitus. See, there's something called habit. Habit, you, you can get rid of a habit. I know people who quit smoking, uh, cold turkey. They just threw away the box and they never went back again. That you, that's how you get rid of a habit. But habitus is, is another word that was framed by this guy, his name is, I think is Bordeaux. He said, when the entire system around the person is supportive of that habit, it's much harder. It becomes habitus. Means you want to lose weight and everybody around you loves candy. And you go into the refrigerator and it's got all kind of junk food. You look at the counter and there's cake. And, and everywhere you look, it, 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 your environment sub, does not support your goals. If your environment does not support your goals, then you got a problem. The issue of culture, you have all these bad habits that we inherited from back home. That many of us, the first generation, I'm not talking about our children. I'm talking about us. Guys like me who've been here for 40 years and still keep saying back home as if I'm going back. After 40 years, I keep catching myself saying back home. This is home, where am I going? And yet we keep saying back home as, as if I'm packing up to go tomorrow. But this is not the problem. The real problem is that we think and behave as if we are still back home. That is, that is the, 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 the part of the culture. And look, if this has to do with what kind of food, as the brother was saying earlier, whether you eat biryani or mensaf, be it. The real problem is not that, is that we want to run modern organizations with multi-million dollar budgets the same way we were running Haritna, Bab al-Hara, or somewhere for Amman or, or so. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. The methodology that we use back home to, back home again, to, to, to do things, it's not, does not work here. So the, the more culture, cultural influence there is on the organization, the less of a chance this organization has to grow. So this is all, the, all these four different things have to do with just the, the looking at our organization. Wallah, ya I can do a PhD dissertation just on, on, the, on Islamic organizations and, and, and these four different areas. Each one of these areas requires a PhD. That's how much work we have. And our children need to roll up their sleeves and get into social sciences and need to find solutions for these problems. Our generation is incapable of even comprehending the severity of this problem. If, it, if our children don't go into sociology and into epistemology and into uh, uh, anthropology and all these subjects that are related to this, then well, this is going to take us another 20, 30 years before we find real solutions. Then there is the membership. I always ask this question. What is the difference between a member and a non-member? You walk into the masjid, and somebody else walks into the masjid. You've been coming to the masjid for 30 years, and somebody else walks into the masjid for the first time. Can you tell the difference? You can. We treat our members, the ones that built the masjid, the same way we treat somebody who is a casual visitor. And I'm not saying we should not welcome them. We're there for them. But shouldn't there be special consideration for those people? Didn't Rasulullah say, Anzilu Nasam and Azalam? Isn't there a hadith that says, give people their due respect? When a woman passed, Rasulullah stood and greeted her. And Aisha asked him, Why did you do that? And he said, Kanat ta'atina ayyam Khadija. She used to come to us on the days of Khadija. There's certain considerations for those people among us that have been. The, 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 the pioneers of these movements, the ones that sacrificed, the ones that stayed up at night building these centers and these, these conferences and everything. Why is it that we treat them exactly the same way as somebody who's, who's a junior, a new one that just came in? And again, I'm not saying that the shahada should be done at the expense of newcomers, but we should have special consideration for those people. And, and I'm not here to give the answer. I don't even know what. I just know that there should be something. And I know that there is, it's missing. What it is has to be an answer that comes through the democratic process. And I'm using the word democratic for the first time in a very positive way. What I mean by it is a concept actually that, we are, that is foreign to many of us. Brother, brother Alyush knows it, which is the concept of deep democracy. 
There is democracy and there's deep democracy. Democracy is for people to vote, like they did in Egypt. Okay, for people to vote, and then a president is elected, and we're done. Everything, the systems and everything remains the same, and nothing ever changes, except we go through the democratic process, which is to cast a vote and to elect, and we're done. يعطينا العافية. Deep democracy means that you get deep into the real issues, that we sit down and we have a discussion, a respectable, but here's what you need. You need to have a very high clash of ideas and a very low clash of egos. Did you get that? For those of you who work on boards, you need to write this down because this could solve a lot of the problems we have in our boards. We need to have a very high clash of ideas and low clash of egos. What we wind up with is very high clash of egos and a very low clash of ideas. And we keep, we keep hovering around the same issues. We never dig deep into the real issues. We, we simply, we, it's all ihtiram and respect and everything. And at, at the end of the day, we wonder why for 20 years we're doing the same thing, same thing. So here, what we need is, what we need is, um, we need to have answers to these questions through the deep democracy process, not the superficial democracy process, where people actually listen when you talk. They're not just waiting for you to finish so that they can say what they have on their mind so that then you can say what you have on your mind. And, and there is this ping pong match of, of ideas without anybody listening. It's like a whole bunch of deaf people talking, nobody's listening. Then there is the people who are not members, the ones that don't come to the masjid. Allah told the Prophet وسلم, to, to give warning to his next of kin, but then to keep widening the circle until, until Sayyidina Umar said, Wallahi, if, if a mule tripped in Baghdad, in Iraq, I, I would be afraid that I would be responsible for it. Are we worried about our community the way Sayyidina Umar was worried about the community or about the way the Prophet وسلم, was worried about the community? Well, I, hearing the, the, second, the last part that I just finished, you would probably think I don't care about those people. I think we live for them. We are here for them. We are in the da'wah for them so that we can bring them into the deen of Allah Azza wa They justify our existence. Without them, there's no need for our organizations. There's no need for mass care or anybody. We exist so that we can serve them and we can make them join this club that, that, that we're, we're, we're reveling in. So hopefully, inshallah, we'll be able to come up with some real good practical goals for our community into, into making our community a better community. And by the way, nothing does that more than a threat. This is documented. Nothing brings people together and makes them aware of their, uh, the need to work together. And nothing makes them shed their apathy better than a threat. Allah, sometimes the, the best thing that could happen is that you feel threatened. Like somebody puts you on a list somewhere. Ooh, I should be afraid. I'm not. But I know there's a lot of people who are afraid. So my next question to them, so what are you going to do about it? You're going to boycott their product? You're not going to fly on their airline? What are you going to do? I don't know the answer. I can only raise questions. And the best answers will come when we get together and have some real good deep democracy. The last thing that we need to worry about is the society that we live in. We Muslims, كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف وتنهون عن المنكر. I does not say كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للعرب. You are not the best Umma extracted for the Arabs or for the for the uh, for, for the Asians or for the Africans. For humanity. Allah Azzawajal sent us so that we can be conduits for the word of Allah Azzawajal to humanity. And wallahi, all we have to do is that look at ourselves and how we behave, and you'll see that we're not doing a good job. We'll see you later on. Assalamu alaikum.